Jacqueline, thanks a lot for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. I was just thinking, like, it seems like now more than ever in 20, I was about to say 2015, in 2017, it seems like there's never been a time where artists are releasing fewer full-length records. People yeah. People are putting out EPs, putting, people are putting out s- s- singles. I had a friend of mine tell me that, you know, her little daughter didn't really even know what an album was, yet this is the year you decided to release a full-length record. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a I have a younger brother who definitely consumes music strictly as like single songs on SoundCloud. Like the concept of a full album doesn't really resonate. I I get you, but then I find that like streaming services have brought like albums back into my life. Mm-hmm. I, I I definitely went through a few years where I was like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, listen, I buy no, no, I buy a lot of records. Yeah, it's yeah. more just as someone trying to someone making their bones, like someone someone making a career in music. It's it's an interesting choice. Oh, it's definitely it's mm-hmm. not a professionally or commercially sound choice. I, I, <laughs> the amount of time and effort it takes to, to release like this collection of songs, I think I can drum up a similar amount of press and interest from promoters around singles and key kind of songs and kind of spread them out. I, I could So why, why do it? I grew up on albums. Uh, albums, uh, you know, kind of marked times of my life. You know, I'll, I'll put one on and it's like, oh, that's that summer. That's that relationship. That's the end of that school year or whatever. That's the beginning of that job. That's when I moved. And uh, and certain songs will have that, but I, I, you know, the album is like, it's the novel. It's like the, <laughs> it's yeah. totally like a artist ego trip thing. But well, yeah. I know what you mean. Like I, when I think about the word record, yeah. what is a record? It's a record. Sure, it's a recording, but it's a record of a time yeah. And place. It's a yeah. time in your life. It, you can look back and say, this is how old I was when I put out this record. It, exactly right. And and from the listener perspective, I feel like you they they enter your life in a similar way. And you and you, the records that you kind of accumulate, whether they be physical or digital, I think kind of have that. Well, for me anyways. And so I kind of I wanted to do that for myself and I wanted to kind of like offer that into the world. It was tough. <laughs> because, what do you mean it was tough? Well, because I I'm, I am from kind of this generation, definitely from a genre of music that is like EP and single driven, and and uh, made music in that format for so long. So taking myself out of that mind state was uh, it kind of having to rewire my brain a little bit. I think you have to like slow time down a mm-hmm, bit because mm-hmm. it's easy to think. I really like the EP format. That's like a short story or something like a novella, and you can kind of just bang it out and, and kind of uh, wrap your head around it, but kind of taking the time off the shows and kind of like taking your time uh, or your attention away from like the stream of new releases and kind of like looking inward and making like, oh, well, what is what is like the Jacques Green album? <laughs> and kind of like <laughs> allowing yourself that thought process is something that like, it's a challenge, but it really worthwhile, I think. I'm hoping you can help me out with something. Like, I don't know if you look over there, like that's a that's a mandolin. And that's, you know, I, I mainly play folk music. And I think if you're listening to this right is that, now. Is that quantized? That is, <laughs> that is quant, that's, quanti, that's quantized mandolin right there. That is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can help me out with, with, a, with a couple of things here. So as a producer, you're known for flipping vocals. Yeah. What, what, is, what, what is involved with flipping, <laughs> what is vocals? flipping vocals? Sorry, man. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to Yeah, no, I, I, that's, uh, that definitely became a, uh, is a huge kind of signature part of the sound. Uh, I really like it because otherwise my music is predominantly kind of machine made. I'm like a synthesizer guy, drum machines, you know, as electronic music as it gets. And I like the inserting kind of vocals into the work. Uh, it, it becomes kind of like this emotional shorthand. I can kind of bring in even less so of a pop thing, but kind of it's something to hang on to that feels a little more human, a little warmer. Right. So you you, t- you take a vocal and then what do you do with it? I so I from and it, I'll take a vocal from anywhere, be it a R and B record or someone singing into their phone on the internet <laughs> that I kind of find somewhere, uh, or friends of mine, and and then try to kind of listen to something that really kind of excites me in the same way that a photographer would look around a landscape and be like, oh, no, like this one little angle, this one little thing Mm -hmm. is interesting. Like I'm very less so into kind of like looping a chorus or anything like that. I think the times I've been at my best is when I found kind of even moments like between words or or like the a one weird little quiver that like I think that that would maybe betray like a, a much like deeper emotion than what's was originally kind of in the song that was sung. And so it becomes like this kind of like emotional shorthand. Like, <laughs> right. it, you know, paints, it, like I can kind of like use them to to kind of run a little deeper than maybe what I could communicate with my own 
sense of melody in my music right so, 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 so a lot a lot of your job is listening to either older recordings um or you know iphone messages as they say people singing yeah. And what are you waiting for? Just that moment where you go, "That's it." Yeah, exactly. I yeah. And I, typically, what is it? Well, typically, what what is it that you love? Can you can you can I, you? Mark I I like it down? honesty. I like I like honesty, and I kind of like a little bit of melodrama. I like I like any moment in a performance, or even like in a in a machine techno record. I like it when uh, it kind of sounds like the synth is gonna break, or like or in a live recording. You know, like live jazz recordings are so exciting. When you feel like the band is like a millisecond away from falling apart, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so yeah. I think that like the best moments in vocal performance are like, oh, like this girl is almost out of her range, like she and she's pushing, but like she has to reach that melody. So you get this like beautiful kind of intensity that is very unique to the human voice or whatever, and so it'll be that or like a, a very kind of like unique turn from a full-bodied voice to a falsetto that like the little things that will kind of perk my ears up and go like, oh my god, that was like such yeah. a unique moment that, you know, I couldn't hire a singer and bring them in here and have them redo that. That was like that time, that place, that person, that emotion. That's how it happened. There's this great Miles Davis record. I don't know if you ever heard it. It's Live at the Plug Nickel. It's like Miles and, and Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter. And they went in, they were on the plane, and they were really kind of bored at how good they were, and they, <laughs> which is a cr- crazy thing to do, you know? And they said, we're going to play the exact opposite of what we think we should play. We're going to play the exact, whatever impulse you have, whatever right. chord you want to play, whatever note you want to play, play the exact opposite of that. And the whole time, it feels like the band's about to fall apart. But you're right. Yeah, it's, that it's, it's the most exciting. Yeah. It's the coolest. That kind of danger of like, you know, live is something that is, you have to work for it when you make music on a computer. <laughs> it's like, it's this weird thing because the computer brings kind of perfection or sequencers even, even kind of hardware Electronic That's so music. interesting, yeah. Uh, there's there's grid, there's, you know, there's, like, sliders for your filters. Everything can be, in a way, kind of perfect, but, like, what? <laughs> I think, uh, I it, like, in, in art, I've always been that way. Like, I think even as a kid, going to something that would be like, wow, in this period of Renaissance painting, they really, light was exactly how it is, can be seen by the eye. And, like, I don't care. I want to, like, I, I'd rather see, like, how your brain processes that sunlight and, like, how twisted you can get, and so like the impressionists end up being kind of interesting to me. So like I think like electronic music and music in general ends up being like, you know, Miles Davis breaking the rules. Like it's like it's once you can kind of like get out of that box and kind of like create those that bit of chaos is when it gets good. Um, scrolling through your SoundCloud page, the two hashtags you you use to, the most to describe your music is house and R and B. Starting start <laughs> start by starting out though, I'm, I'm interested. What what do you love about house music? Uh oh man, what do I love about house music? Uh, it's it's effective. I love that it has a purpose. I love that uh, I love that dance music is kind of like function over form in its kind of purest format. It's just like, will people dance to it? Yes. Then objectively, it's a good dance record. And I think I I, I like that kind of like workmanship mentality of of house and techno. And so I think as a kid. I was like when when I kind of like discovered electronic music, it was more through like IDM Prism and like Ninja Tune and Aphex Twin. But uh, as I got into my twenties and I found kind of like dumb as bricks, like house and techno, I was mm-hmm. really excited by it. I think there's something very pure about it. Uh, I like that idea of of function over over form. It, 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 you you have one barometer of success. You have one metric of success. Yeah. Are they dancing to it? No. Yeah. Well, it's not working. Right. And then and then from there you can like take your chances and kind of like mess with the formula a little bit, but it still has to serve one purpose. And I kind of like that. Like I that that kind of like is a set of rules that is vague enough that I can have fun in the sandbox, but I I still have like a a goal mm-hmm. <laughs> when I'm uh when, when I'm in the studio or whatever. So I I really and, and house music is amazing. It it comes from the lineage of of kind of like disco and funk and these big kind of diva vocals and it uh, simultaneously is this kind of functional machine driven music but has always had this like huge element of melody and warmth and spirit and kind of like soulfulness. But you add even more to it because a lot of the press around this record talks about your ability to combine house with R&B. Right. You know what is it about that combination of those two forms that you find so inspiring? Uh, I mean, for me, they're kind of like tools that work together, but also the uh, house grew from guys kind of like looping their favorite little segments from 
disco and gospel records. So essentially, like, kind of their contemporary, uh, very good kind of, like, uh, at its roots, like, black vocal music. And so I think, like, in a way, it just seems to be kind of a continuation of, of that, kind of, like, uh, sampling and interpolating kind of, uh, a kind of cult, you know, contemporary canon, like something that exists concurrent to me, and it, like the the vocals of R and B are like I I'm I love R and B, everything from the '90s more New Jack Swing stuff to even the current uh, life that it has inside the strip club. I guess uh, <clears throat> you get like in the same way that I kind of I'm drawn to house. I think that I like R and B's honesty and kind of like a lot of times lack of pretense. It's like an audio like soap opera. Like you you kind of like the songs either about like I really want to sleep with you or like I'm really heartbroken by what you did to yeah, me right, or like yeah. I really can't handle all these girls that want to sleep with yeah, me. It's, <laughs> like, not, it's not vague. It's not vague and it's very honest and it's very kind of like yeah. There's there's this lack of iron ironic detachment and this lack of kind of like posturing that is very thrilling to me because I feel like you get closer to something kind of real and mm-hmm. exciting. Well, yeah. I mean, your, mu- your music does come across as, as, as very honest to me and I'm not, I'm not a, um, uh, an aficionado or an, an expert by any means, but it does come across as, as maybe uncynical if that's yeah, even possible. Well, I think that's like a big thing I strive for because in life I am insanely cynical and, and very, I'll, uh, I'll use sarcasm and cynicism as a coping mechanism probably far too often. Right. I think we all do. Yeah. I think uh, we live in an era that is maybe dangerously steeped in cynicism and uh, ironic detachment. Mm-hmm. And I guess I kind of like use my music as this kind of therapeutical, kind of like aspirational trying to be a better person <laughs> and kind of find this arena where I can be super earnest and kind of like wear things on my sleeve and be you know, honest and kind of bare all. And I'm sure that in some circles, you know, there must be some electronic producers out there who are so kind of like guarded in the music that they put out there. Probably like, hey, you hear that new Jacques Green? That's <laughs> like all those melodies. Like, what is he even thinking? Like, right. I think, I think like with earnest kind of music, uh, you always kind of expose yourself to, you're, you're exposing yourself basically because that's what the ironic detachment and is. And, and it's, it's like kind it's of scary. Like a shell. Yeah, it's scary. And, yeah, but I, I kind of, it's one of those thrills that I kind of like. That's exciting to me. Well, let's hear another track. This is a True featuring Tom Krell. It goes by the stage name How to Dress Well. called True, featuring the singer How to Dress Well. It's off Feel Infinite, the debut album for my guest, producer and DJ Jacques Green. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about you getting these getting these snippets of songs and, you know, either sampling or taking people's iPhone yeah. recordings and how you, t- you, can, you can take those beautiful moments that they send you that can't necessarily be replicated and then you put them into your music. Now, this is an example of a song where you're collaborating with a, with a singer. Yeah. In there, the studio with you. Um, how, does that, how does working with a singer in the studio differ than flipping vocals, than using samples? It's, uh, it's simultaneously, like, very exciting. Uh, Tom, how to dress well, and I have, like, a... Uh, relationship like we're friends so it we you know we actually made it together in a studio which is like more rare than you would think in uh contemporary i bet yeah a uh, singer producer uh, you're not you're not mailing producers. off tracks to him or emailing them and he's yeah like i find like a lot of tracks out there you can almost like 
hear like the Gmail exchange between management, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. kind of like setting them up. Like, a, a, well, like a, for instance, a lot of rap music or like you know the, the the rappers are kind of on tour or whatever, and they receive like a zip file of like thirty instrumentals, and they just kind of like pick and choose the ones they want. But uh, Tom's a good friend of mine, and I was very excited to like actually have uh, in person collaboration, and it's and it's cool because I having listened to a lot of vocals and being kind of really into the pop and R&B thing, I know what I'm going for. But then I, I kind of turn into a bit of like a control freak, like um, like really evil like record producer. Not evil. Like it was very friendly, but I'm like, I know the take I want. Yeah. So like I, I was like, no, you got to go back and you got to do that again. Right. And, <laughs> and you're still friends? Oh, oh man, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I think like, and it, it ended up being a record that we're both like proud of, but right. like I'm, uh, it's funny because I haven't done those things as often. And so it, it's definitely it's a whole other job. Like running a, a studio session with a singer is like a man. It's it's uh, it's a, it's a whole job. It's a whole thing. Um, do, you, do you prefer one or the other? I think with everything in uh, in my career in general, I think the the variety is a spice of life yeah. thing rings really true. Like I'll I'll make a record and by the end of it, I you know I hate myself. Oh my god, I'm not worthy. Like what am I doing? And then I like. I'm, I'm no good at music, but then I kind of finish a record. I go on the road and I'm playing it, and people react well to it. I'm like, oh no, actually this totally works. And then uh, being able to exchange music, you know, with people, feeds off. But then I get homesick, and then I go back home. And the same goes with like the different types of music I'll make. And so uh, the idea that I've been able to like keep my lanes very kind of open and varied. So if someone who's not very familiar with me like goes to my SoundCloud page or listens to my records, they'll be like, whoa, this is. You know, there's house records over here. There's a techno kind of thing happening over there. There's R&B stuff, and the same happens in the DJ mixes. To me, that's a way of, like, keeping myself interested mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and excited and passionate. I think if I honed in on just, like, one thing that I did day in, day out, I would, like, I, I wouldn't do this. We've been talking mainly so far as about your work as a producer, your work in the studio. And as you as you kind of alluded to earlier, you could spend your entire life in a studio, in your house even, making beats, yeah. making songs, sending them off to people, maybe for collaborations, but really just putting them out on SoundCloud. And you can you can have a pretty good life. Yeah. But instead, you don't. You're also a really in-demand live DJ touring North America, the world. Before we turn yeah. the microphones on, you said you're only here for like a few more days. How has playing to live audiences, not just staying in the studio, how has playing to live audiences shaped the music that you make? Yeah, it's it has a huge effect that actually sometimes you have to uh, be careful of and not let it shape your sound too much because it can be very easy to get out of the studio, start playing some of your music, and then if you know if if all goes well and you're kind of successful, you end up playing bigger rooms, and bigger rooms demand different records. And uh, what do you mean? What's 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 like? What's a record that would work in a big room that wouldn't work in a small room? Well, there, there's stuff as simple as like with bigger crowds, kind of more drawn out breakdowns and buildups kind of and big payoffs kind of, you know, that big room yep. electronic music stuff kind of works better. And then stuff as simple as, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was reading David Byrne's book, How Music Works, and he's talking about like writing all that early Talking head stuff for CBGBs and then being super excited about playing Carnegie Hall. And then they show up there and, you know, they're their percussion is bouncing all over the room and they sound terrible in there because they didn't write their music for that. Right. And I've had the same thing a couple times where I've played kind of like bigger cavernous, you know, indoor festival scene, stages or whatever. And a lot of my drums will be like slightly off, off kilter, that kind of purposeful <laughs> imperfection I was talking about before. And, and uh, maybe like slightly hectic kind of like hi-hat programming. And I'll just kind of be there and like, Oh my God! Like I can hear these things bouncing all over the room, and so I think you'll hear in a lot of kind of like custom-made big room dance music tools. There is like an abject, like there's a simplicity, like you know, really like filing down that sculpture to bare kind of essentials and and other kind of like effects, right? And that informs you when you go into the studio when you're well, at home. Well, I try not to. That's so. That's the whole thing. That's kind of what I'm getting at. It's like. That's why when I was working on the record, I would book kind of like really last minute small club things that were like my favorite kind of size things. Mm -hmm. And so when I was testing out mixes of these new songs, I wasn't like 
you know, making sure they worked for 2,000 people at 4 a.m., I was just like, oh, do they kind of sound good in a 75-person bar at 1 a.m.? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and those, are, those are kind of like weird conscious choices and things that end up, you know, if, mm. if you don't watch out, you end up that guy that like all of a sudden your music has gone like really dull and, and dumb. Do you have a preference? Like, do you prefer being in the studio or is it the same thing? Variety is the spice of life. You wouldn't be able to do one without the other. I, yeah, I really, I think I need... I need to like make the music. I don't think I could be like just a DJ, and uh, and I I think I end up being like I get cabin fever if I spend too long in the studio. So I like I really I'm so grateful that I get to do both. I, uh, like obviously, eventually it'd be nice to figure out a way to like you know I feel like once I'm in my late thirties or whatever, I like, stay stay home a little. I don't want to be like the guy in the club. Right. <laughs> so that, that's the interesting point because yesterday we were we had a long talk about this with my producer Ty out there. We were, we were having grand old chats about horror stories of live DJing and talking about, you know, just dealing with audiences and dealing with crowds. We've been super excited to ask you this question. Any any stories particularly stick out in your head? People getting too close, people coming up? Oh, man. There are so many. Like, they got one? Can you think of one? One, one that just jumps to mind right away is was this was like years ago playing like a loft party in Montreal and uh, we're getting the party started. Finally, it's really kind of going and this girl <laughs> kind of leans over and goes like, oh my God, so you're like the DJ? And like does this like mimicking, like that classic mimicking, like scratching table, the record, scratching, yep. like holding the hand up to the, cusping the ear, but actually does it to the record while two are mixing in together and... I just, you know, had to like stop everything and be like, <laughs> "Whoa, um, yeah." There, there's <laughs> sorry. While you said that, our producer Ty got in my ears and he said, "Told you." <laughs> <laughs> he knew. He knew that would be the one. Is someone getting up and trying to scratch the records? Oh man, there's and and variations of that have happened so many times of people like somehow managing to get in DTG booths and being like. Um, like, so what are you doing up here? And like trying to have a conversation or like trying to like, or nowadays, I think like people think that they can just get selfies all the time or just right, like load right, up their right, Snapchat right, right, yeah, all yeah, the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And so I've, I, I've been in like slightly more intimate club settings where, you know, the, the, the booth isn't necessarily like far off. And I like that. It's kind of fun to be like in the cut. But then for someone to either come in and, like, you know, the flash automatically goes on when you do a Snapchat video or something. And so all of a sudden there's, like, strobes on, right? <laughs> or someone will just, like, try to, like, the phone is literally kind of in front of you trying to take photos and, like, trying to have a conversation with you. And that's that's psychotic. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, <laughs> there's, like, a lack of social awareness there that is really, really confusing to me. I, I, just before we let you go, man, this has been a lot of fun talking to you. Um, Likewise. What's been the... You know, I know, I know, I know. In addition to making some really kind of groundbreaking new dance music, you're also a student, and you also love dance music throughout yeah. the years. What if you could isolate to me? Like, what do you think is the biggest difference between the dance music that's made in the past and the dance music that audiences want to hear, the dance music that's being made right now? I think uh, electronic music is, by kind of definition, technology driven, and uh, I think. If you seek out on the uh, kind of outer edges, there is some really exciting and crazy club music being made. Like uh, even if you stretch that definition, people like Arca and uh, Kingdom are making stuff that is like completely off the grid. It sounds insane. Like you, you can't even picture the session file. You know, it's it just like it just feels like this amorphous goop of sound. Mm -hmm. And I find that stuff really exciting and that's only possible by what's being done today. Whereas like a lot of the records that I love from like this classic Chicago house or uh, early Detroit techno will, will be like, for better or for worse, I find it amazing because I'm like also a huge uh, tech nerd. But you can, you can kind of like see the sequencer and you can see the old MIDI sequencers and the old boxes that would run these these sessions, you know, they're very rudimentary. Yeah. There'll, there'll be like five sounds and like they change three times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas now there's like this infinite possibility, not only of sound sculpting and of sequencing, but also people are much more open to like, not necessarily st sticking to one genre. And it doesn't seem like a nostalgic thing. It doesn't seem like, oh, well, I came up using this particular software and this particular piece of hardware. I'm going to stick with it. Yeah, there's, there's that exists though. Right, in, but, but in techno, that, there's But like, that's not your thing? No, I, 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 
I say that I own some of that gear. Like I, I own some of those like uh, those classic kind of '80s rolling pieces of equipment. But I've always tried to like subvert them a little, <laughs> use them slightly differently, and like kind of uh, uh, really use them solely in contemporary ways. I think the idea of buying gear made 20 years ago to make music that sounds exactly like 20 years ago is like a a very confusing thing to me, especially when you're working in electronic music and techno that's supposed to be modern. It's supposed to be the future. Like <laughs> pretending like it's thirty like eighty six is like not <laughs> I don't get that. Shock Green, it's been a real pleasure, man. Likewise. Thank you so much for coming in and talking about your record. Thank you for having me. And congratulations on it. Thanks so much.